Hello, and welcome to my oral report for class NUC 495. I am Joshua Love, and this report is about the candle that changed nuclear power. Without further ado, let's get started. My report is over the Browns Ferry nuclear plant fire, a casualty that took place March 22, 1975. Though the casualty only caused several small injuries to the workers that participated in the firefighting efforts that day, the fire caused a tremendous shift in the regulation of nuclear plants in the United States. My report will provide background information on significant organizations and developments that occurred before the fire, review major events that took place during the fire, summarize the findings of the investigations conducted after the fire, review the development of fire protection programs that occurred because of the fire, and explain how the casualty continues to shape the future of nuclear regulations. In order to stay within the time limits for this report, I will be separating this into three parts. The first part will cover an overview of the Browns Ferry nuclear plant. The second part will cover a review of the Browns Ferry nuclear plant fire. And the third part will cover the reactions to the fire. In this first segment, we will cover an overview of the Browns Ferry nuclear plant. We will review the formation of the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission explain the establishment of the Browns Ferry nuclear plant, and discuss the construction of the Browns Ferry nuclear plant's cooling systems. The use of atomic bombs against the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945 set the stage for nuclear power in America. The world would finally witness the tremendous power that had been hidden within the very atoms that make up all matter on this earth. It did not take very long for the American public's imaginations to start wondering just how this technology could be utilized. Many scientists were quickly predicting that nuclear power could provide peaceful applications that were as beneficial as nuclear weapons or destructive. Of course, these applications would take years to develop, and sadly, the priority of the time was to conceal atomic technology from the enemies of the United States, especially the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. In 1946, the government formed the United States Atomic Energy Commission. The United States Atomic Energy Commission would manage the nation's atomic energy programs, investigate military applications of nuclear power, and ensure the confidentiality of American atomic projects. When Soviet Russia tested their own nuclear bomb in 1949, the necessity for secrecy vanished. Priorities changed, and the United States government would place the development of nuclear power into the hands of the American public. The Atomic Energy Act of 1954 reorganized the Atomic Energy Commission and made it responsible for both the promotion and the regulation of civilian nuclear plant applications. But the expansion of nuclear power would prove to be a difficult task to regulate. Finally, in 1971, the United States Atomic Energy Commission would be sued by the Calvert Cliffs Coordinating Committee concerning the Atomic Energy Commission's responsibilities under the National Environmental Policy Act. The act required federal agencies to catalog all environmental factors imposed in major federal actions. This included the establishment, licensing, and construction of nuclear plants. The Atomic Energy Commission was utilizing the research of other agencies as their own justification for approval in areas they considered non-nuclear. The Atomic Energy Commission was also relying on the standards of other agencies to be good enough for the Atomic Energy Commission to continue issuing license to reactors. The court would not agree, and they would state that the, AC, the Atomic Energy Commission could not abdicate its function and rely on the standards of other agencies. During the trial, the court would accuse the Atomic Energy Commission of failing to fulfill its mandated responsibility of public safety concerning the regulation of nuclear reactors. The public distrust of the Atomic Energy Commission would come to a peak in 1972, when the Atomic Energy Commission would end a two-year-long public rule hearing about the requirements for emergency core cooling systems. Previous Atomic Energy Commission employees would claim on several different public interviews that they did not actually know if the approved cooling systems would work. The hearing 
would cause a large amount of public discussion about the roles of the Atomic Energy Commission and whether it was fully diverging information about the plants it licensed. The public did not trust that the Atomic Energy Commission was properly regulating the plants that it pushed so hard to create. In 1973, President Nixon directed the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission to develop a program to significantly increase research into energy development. The report given to Congress in 1974 included the disestablishment of the Atomic Energy Commission. The report would go on to form the Energy Reorganization Act of 1974, which would officially dissolve the Atomic Energy Commission on the 19th of January of 1975. The Atomic Energy Commission would be turned into two entities, the Energy Research and Development Administration, which would be responsible for the promotion and further research of developing technologies, and the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission would inherit the policies published by the Atomic Energy Commission and become the regulatory entity over the nuclear power in the United States. The American public was filled with hope, but the Nuclear Regulatory Commission would quickly find itself facing major issues with one of its licensees. The Tennessee Valley Authority was initially founded in 1933 as a part of President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal initiative. The Tennessee Valley Authority was tasked with promoting economic growth in and around the Tennessee River Valley area. While it, this started with a broad goal that included the flood prevention, river navigation, and soil reclamation, the Tennessee Valley Authority eventually focused on the generation and distribution of electric power. With the federal government providing funding for its investments, the Tennessee Valley Authority quickly became a huge major player in the highly competitive world of energy distribution in the southern United States. Eventually, the Tennessee Valley Authority decided to invest in a large capacity nuclear power plant. The Browns Ferry nuclear plant was the first design submitted to the United States that would provide more than a thousand megawatts of electrical energy per unit. The Browns Ferry nuclear plant was built on the north shore of Wheeler Lake, which is part of the Tennessee Wither River near Decatur, Alabama. The plant contains three separate boiling water reactors designed by General Electric. The Browns Ferry nuclear plant permit for construction was issued in 1967. The operational license of Unit 1 was issued in 1973. The operational license of Unit 2 was issued in 1974. At the time, there were two General Electric boiling water reactors rated for 1,100 megawatts. The third unit was still under construction in the mid-1970s. The Browns Ferry plant was designed with several different systems capable of cooling the plant. This included the normal removal of heat via the main condensers, the removal of heat via the residual heat removal system, and the removal of heat via the safety valves and make of water systems. The primary cooling systems while the plant was operating were the main condensers. By sending steam from the reactor vessel to the condensers, heat could be transferred from the core to the circulating water system that cooled the condensers. The water from the core could then be returned through the, to the reactor vessel through a series of electric powered condensate pumps, electric powered condensate booster pumps, and steam-driven feed water pumps. The residual heat removal system would normally cool the plant after it was shut down. This system would allow for water in the reactor vessel to be directly pumped by several electric power pumps through heat exchangers cooled by river water when the reactor vessel was at low pressures. In the event of a casualty and the main steam isolation valves went shut, a set of relief valves was attached to the reactor vessel side of the main steam isolation valves. These valves could actuate to relieve pressure on the reactor vessel. As temperature and pressure increased, the relief valves would open and send steam to a large pool of water called the suppression pool. The relief valves relied on other reactor water systems to provide water to the reactor vessel in order to keep the core cooled. 
the relief valves would automatically maintain a safe pressure in the reactor vessel, but the pressure would be rather high, meaning that only high pressure reactor water sources could be used as makeup water to cool the reactor. Remote manual electric operation of these relief valves was available to maintain a lower pressure in the reactor vessel. This would allow for one of the low pressure reactor makeup water sources to keep, reactor, keep the reactor cool. The Browns Ferry nuclear plant was designed with many high pressure and low pressure reactor water makeup sources to maintain the core cover. These sources were required to be provided by several redundant systems at a, as a part of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's defense in depth concept on reactor safety. The high pressure systems consisted of reactor core isolation cooling pumps, high pressure coolant injection pumps, control rod drive pumps, standby liquid control pumps, and feed water pumps. As you can see in the display, high pressure reactor water could be provided to the reactor vessel by one of the multiple systems of pumps, including the steam driven reactor core isolating cooling pumps, the electric powered high pressure coolant injection system pumps, the electric power control ride draw pumps, the electric powered standby liquid control system pumps, and the steam driven reactor feed water system pumps. This gave the operator several different redundant systems to provide makeup water in the event of a casualty. On top of that, there were low pressure systems that could provide makeup water as well. The low pressure systems consisted of residual heat removal pumps, core spray pumps, the condensate and condensate booster pumps, and a standby coolant supply pump. As you can see in this display, the low pressure reactor water could be provided by several electric powered residual heat removal system pumps, the electric powered core spray pumps, and the electric powered condensate and condensate booster pumps. Additionally, river water could be pumped directly to the reactor vessel if the need arose using electric powered in place service water pumps. Though these cooling systems were made to be redundant, the fire would end up disabling many of them, causing the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to have to reassess whether fires could be considered a non-nuclear issue. In conclusion, we reviewed the formation of the United States Regulatory Commission, explained the establishment of the Brownsbury Nuclear Plant, and discussed the construction of the Brownsbury Nuclear Plant's cooling system.